Now, from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. Last night here on CBS 4, we aired an hour long special called Everglades, where money, politics and race collide. Now, if you missed it, you can watch it online by going to cbsmiami.com backslash Everglades. And even if you did watch last night, there's a lot more additional information on the website, so you may want to visit it. Now, this morning, we're going to highlight parts of the special where I trace the origins of the toxic algae bloom that hit the Treasure Coast last year. And I talk about Everglades restoration, all issues that affect everyone living in South Florida. Here's a part of last night's special. Here, Gator, 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 Gator. Marshall Jones grew up in the Everglades. His great grandfather started this fishing camp in 1932. The Everglades has sustained my family for five generations. Growing up as, as a boy, the Everglades was my playground. I'm a family man. I have four amazing children, and I want them to see the same Everglades as I grew up with, or better. If the start of 2016 had heavier than expected rains, the start of 2017 saw the glades facing a drought. When that happens, the vast majority of the wildlife uh, here dies. Uh, they have nothing left to feed on, and there's nothing left for them to survive in. Jones took us to a spot where gators and fish were able to find water, and it is not just the wildlife that's affected. If there's no standing water within the river of grass, the aquifer is not being replenished. In other words, we can endanger our own drinking water, because if there isn't fresh water filling the aquifer, then salt water from the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico will push its way in, not only killing the seagrass and fish nurseries in Florida Bay, but eventually winding up in the aquifer. When that happens, we have a major problem. The water can't be used for regular tap water, and it can also no longer be used to water lawns or water our fields to the south here in, in, in Homestead and the Redlands. Now, we'll play more of our special throughout today's show, but let's bring in this morning's guest. Jenny Stiletovich covers the environmental issues for the Miami Herald, and Michael Grunwald is a writer with Politico, and he's also the author of the book, The Swamp, which examined Everglades history and restoration efforts. I want to thank you both for coming in. Thank you. Um, I also appreciate the fact that you both sat through and watched uh, the, the special. <laughs> it was uh, awesome. Well, it's I appreciate great. it. Thank Everybody you very much. Uh, but I, I want to just start with the, with the sort of the old overriding question, which is, you know, why should people care about the Everglades? A lot of people don't even visit the Everglades. They see it as some place where you go and get really bad mosquito bites. But, you know, the person that we saw there a second ago from Max Fish Camp, he sort of began to explain it. Michael, why should we care about what goes on in the Everglades? Well, here are, here are like three quick reasons, right? One is that it really is this, this international treasure. There are no other Everglades on Earth, and it's just an amazing place. There's nothing else like it. Um, it's right in our backyard. Um, it's really one of the things that makes Florida, Florida. Um, but also, as you suggested, the, basically the Florida economy depends on the Everglades because the water sitting underneath the Everglades is really our drinking water for South Florida. Without it, we can't have development. Without it, we can't have agriculture. Um, and then the third reason is that really, I mean, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas said that the Everglades is a test. If we pass, we may get to keep the planet. And we have, right going on right here in our backyards, the largest environmental restoration project in the history of the planet and uh, you know we're gonna see whether we can have a civilization sitting right next to this natural treasure we're spending 20 billion dollars and the world is watching to see whether we get it right Jenny when when you sort of go about writing about environmental issues but particularly mm -hmm. the Everglades do you find it a little challenging that you have to present things in a way to try to draw readers in yes like you said a lot of people have never been there before so trying to it's the, the, it, the Everglades have this sort of minimal beauty and describing that in words can sometimes be a challenge. It's Tell more a feeling. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's very difficult to kind of engage people on that level. It's easier when you tell them you will have no drinking water. <laughs> that they kind of get. Right. But getting, but the sense of beauty out there is it's stunning. I mean, you've been. I always, there. I always it's say really it's, it's less ooh and ah than hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, just a little bit about our path on, on how we started with this. Last year, we obviously had 
that incredible blue-green toxic algae crisis in the Treasure Coast. And that and that's really start, formed the basis for what I started trying to explore. And you start working through that issue, that, that algae crisis that shut down beaches and businesses and had a terrible effect in the economy and may have long-term health effects as well. And you start realizing how interrelated everything is. The algae crisis then takes you to understanding about Lake Okeechobee and how phosphorus in Lake Okeechobee can contribute to it. And if you start talking about Lake Okeechobee, you start talking about the dike around the lake. And then you start talking about Everglades restoration. You find that everything is interconnected when you start talking about the Everglades and all these water systems, Michael. That's exactly right. Because remember, all of Central and South Florida used to be connected by essentially the Everglades ecosystem. It was just this sheet of shallow, incredibly clean water that flowed all the way down the peninsula. And, uh, and so now all of these problems that we have in the, in the Everglades ecosystem, whether it's the flocculent glop over in Martin County, or you, you can't breathe at the beach over around Fort Myers, or Florida Bay, you know, having its own sort of collapse, and, and the Everglades itself, where you see 95% of the wading birds are gone. These are all connected. They're all the same problem, as, as well as some of our problems where, you know, we're worried about the drinking water and that we're worried about whether we're going to be able to have development and agriculture in the future. And they're all essentially the same problem of the water isn't right anymore. It's too dirty and it doesn't flow. You well, covered what was connected is now like a puzzle all broken up into pieces that we can't figure out how to fit back together. And man again. keeps inter intersecting right, those right, lines. Right, right. It's very and it was all done for us. It right. was all, it's, it's the most elaborate water management system in, you know, in America. And, uh, you know, it's like 2,000 miles of levees and canals. You got pumps so powerful that the, the engines had to be cannibalized from nuclear submarines. And that's how we can live here. That's how we can farm here. Um, but it just isn't, it's not sustainable right now. I wanted to go back to the algae crisis. You covered uh, that a fair amount. Mm -hmm. You wrote about that. Walk me through your impressions of it. And just in terms of, like, when you realized what was happening on the Treasure Coast in terms of this thick blue-green toxic algae that sort of like oatmeal you know, tracing its roots, and, and talk to me a little bit about what you found during well, covering all that. It wasn't the first time there's been that kind of crisis on the coast. It's happened before, so it was. I don't think it was a huge surprise. I think what was really bad this time was visually. The stuff was just I, that guacamole thick stuff yeah. was really alarming. And as you pointed out in in the show, um, you had the Senate president. It, it happening in his hometown. Right. Um, so you knew, like, this is not going to go quietly away. This is not going to be ignored. This is going to be something. We talk about the politics of the Everglades, and that was, that was, what you mentioned is that the algae crisis took place around the Stewart area of Florida, and mm -hmm. Stewart is represented by a state senator named Joe Negron, who happened to be coming in as the new Senate president, which makes him one of the most powerful political figures in Tallahassee, and as a result of his constituents yelling and screaming about the algae crisis, he made that his number one priority, right. you know, in Tallahassee. And so that led to creating Senate Bill 10, which was this idea of taking farmland, 60,000 acres of farmland south of the lake, building a reservoir so that instead of shooting water from Lake Okeechobee, dirty water east and west where it could form an algae bloom, you send the water south to be cleaned and then down into the Everglades. It sounds simple, but really Senate Bill 10 doesn't really do necessarily what we think it does and it also creates a situation where you then pit an environmentalist against sugar. Michael, you've written a lot about Big Sugar. Is Big Sugar a villain or how do you view Big Sugar? <laughs> well, it's funny. I have uh, I have sort of one of the more I'm kind of ambivalent view about them because parts of it is true, right? There's this, they have this reputation of controlling the legislature. They absolutely do. Republicans and Democrats. Nobody does anything that, that Sugar doesn't want. And uh, they have this reputation as being this kind of environmental scoff law, which is also somewhat true, because they are in the Everglades, they're in the northern Everglades, they block the flow, they like to be dry when the Everglades like to be wet, they do have some, you know, pesticides, they have phosphorus in their, in their, in their fertilizers that are not ideal for the Everglades, but what they will tell you, and what is also true, is that they are much cleaner than they used to be, that they are not the main source of that flocculent glop over in the East 
coast, and uh, and that essentially, you know, it's up to the legislature. It's not, you know, it's not. They're not the ones making the decisions. That uh, that if you're upset about what's happening in the Everglades, that your ire is more properly targeted towards the politicians rather than you know who are doing what Big Sugar wants them to do. But you know, Big, Big Sugar, that's what corporations do. All right. So you had a situation. So again, let's take a step back. You had Lake Okeechobee, which is the second largest lake in the in the continental United States. It's you know filled with with bad phosphorus that comes some of it back pumped over decades from Big Sugar and the surrounding area south of it, a little bit of it, but most of it flowing from the north from the cattle ranches and orange groves and all the development from Kissimmee from and Orlando, Orlando all the way south. It's a sewer pipe for Orlando. Basically, yeah. everything flows down into the lake. So you have this lake filled with phosphorus and nitrogen and all these pollutants that when the gates are opened and the phosphor and the, that water is jetted out east and west, it creates the algae blooms or is a major contributor to it. So why do they have to pump the water out east and west? Well, because they have to keep the lake at a lower level because the dike around the lake is falling apart. So I want to play a part of this because this brings us to the Army Corps of Engineers, who I think everyone universally can agree, or most people end up agreeing, don't, nobody likes the Army Corps of Engineers <laughs> unless you're married to an Army Corps of Engineer person. And even then, who knows? So let's play, I want to play this I section. I say that. I, I, I work with I, I want to play that section <laughs> for, about the Army Corps of Engineers, and, and let's, let's play that now, and then we'll talk about it. Keeping the water in place? The Herbert Hoover Dyke, a 143-mile earthen berm that encircles the lake. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which operates the 70-year-old dyke, determined in 2005 it was on the verge of collapse. And more than a decade later, it remains in a dire state, as Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Reynolds explained recently to the Florida State Senate. Um, that, that dam is not safe for the people that live and work around the lake. For the 40,000 people at risk who live just south of the dike, the threat seemed all too familiar. In 1928, a hurricane slammed into Lake Okeechobee, causing the lake to overflow its banks and flood the nearby towns of Belle Glade, Pahokee, South Bay, and Clewiston. As many as 3,000 people were killed. Photos from the Florida archives illustrate the aftermath. Homes destroyed, bodies lining the street, rows of makeshift coffins. When the most recent problems with the Herbert Hoover Dyke were discovered, the Corps initiated emergency repairs. But the pace has been gradual, with Congress slow to fund the $1.6 billion project. As of now, the repairs are not expected to be complete until 2025. Where Washington let us down, I would say, is the complete ineptitude of the Army Corps of Engineers. I mean, you can't make it up. Their systems are horrible. The managing of Lake Okeechobee, the dike, that's still going on. I mean, that's a serious uh, issue that needs to be fixed. J.P. Sasser was the longtime mayor of Pahokee, which sits in the shadow of the dike and will be wiped away if it were to breach. I don't blame the Army Corps. They're the Army. They follow orders. You go find out who's giving them the orders, and you say, give them the goddamn order to finish the dike and then fund it. I work very closely with the Army Corps of Engineers. All they care about is doing their job the best to their ability. But they're caught constantly with political infighting. They're told one minute to do this, they're told the next minute to do that. Fund the people, put the money where it needs to go and let the people do their job and stay the out of the damn middle of it. All right, I want to get your reaction to the Army Corps of Engineers in a second, but let's take a break first and when we come back, more of our discussion.